Good evening. Welcome. We're more or less sitting comfortably. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm director of the Institute for Government, and we're d delighted to be having this discussion this evening on public inquiries. Uh, how can they lead to change? To coincide with the report which we've just published uh, by Emma Norris and Marcus Shepherd, uh, which has got a certain amount of media attention uh, this morning. Some of it more or less in line with what we're saying. Indeed. <laughs> Um, in the way of this Christmas season, uh, more people will be continuing to come in, uh, and uh, this has been the way all, all week, and we welcome them. Um, we've got uh, Emma Norris is going to kick us off by talking about the report. Uh, she's program director here at the Institute on Policy Making, but this was a short, sharp uh, report which we put out, very much focusing among all the many aspects that one might pick up about inquiries, focusing on uh, the endpoint: what can we do? Uh, to make recommendations stick more often than they seem to do at the moment. Delighted to have with us as well Jason Beer, QC, who's one of the UK's leading experts in public inquiries and has, uh, is the author of a book called Public Inquiries, in fact, which we, are, uh, we have chosen to call the definitive textbook on the matter, soon to come into its second edition. He's currently leading counsel to the Anthony Granger Inquiry um, and has been instructed by the government on Grenfell. Is that right? and so maybe constrain what he can say on that. He's previously worked on the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, Billy Wright, Rosemary Nelson, and Zahid Mubarak inquiries. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And then we have, as I always feel like saying, uh, um, someone who needs no introduction in this kind of um, gathering, Joshua Rosenberg, um, uh, Britain's, um, no, we, we might as well go with the superlatives, uh, yeah, best, I, no, I best, best known <laughs> legal commentator, and uh, he presents, of course, Law in Action on Radio 4 and serves as chair of Halsbury, Halsbury's Law Exchange and has always, uh, uh, well, many, many years, uh, written and spoken for the BBC and Daily Telegraph. So welcome, all of you. Um, this is the re report which we are discussing. And uh, Emma, without, if you'd like to sure. start off. Thank you. So as Bronwyn mentioned, today the Institute has launched a new report looking at how public inquiries can lead to change. And for this report we looked at the 68 public inquiries that have taken place since 1990 and we found that despite the enormous potential that these inquiries have to change policy and practice, too often they fail to do so. And we argue that the government needs to make a more substantial effort to implement inquiry recommendations and that Parliament needs to make holding government to account for this a core part of their work. But before I start getting into the detailed recommendations that we produce, I want to start by talking about what public inquiries are for. So public inquiries are a permanent part of, uh, of, of public life, if you like now. Central and devolved governments have spent almost £640 million on them um, since 1990, and they've made more than 2,500 different recommendations for change. The government currently has eight different inquiries running, um, including obviously the Grenfell Tower Inquiry, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse, and the newly announced Inquiry into Blood Contamination. And in all those cases, in all of the eight inquiries that are going on at the moment, they out outline serious institutional failures that have contributed to suffering, in some cases loss of life, and they've led to a sufficient injury to public confidence in government that an independent body has been charged with investigating. So once they're established, inquiries usually aim to answer three questions in our view. First of all, what happened? Second, as far as a public inquiry can answer the question, who is to blame? And thirdly, how can we learn from this to prevent future disasters? Now the first two questions, what happened and who is to blame, are critically important. Victims and families deserve to know what happened and deserve to at least begin to understand the sources of blame. And the instances where this hasn't happened, Hillsborough, Aberfan, are all too easy for us to recall um, and we clearly do not want to see them repeated. But it's on that third question, how we can learn um, from the events in question to prevent future disasters that we think our institutions and our processes are currently at their weakest and it's here that our work is focused. Inquiries clearly have to be forward-looking, they have to be catalysts for change. But despite that, there's no firm procedure for holding government to account for the promises made in the aftermath of inquiries. The implementation of recommendations is patchy and in some case repeat incidents have occurred and there's no system for allowing inquiries to build on the learning of their predecessors. There's nowhere in government that captures um, institutional memory for how to run inquiries um, well. 
So now I'm going to focus on how we can improve this situation for the remainder of my remarks. Now, what we're not arguing in the report is that inquiries have not had success in changing things for the better. They absolutely have. Following the Piper Alpha inquiry, regulators, government and industry all bought into a powerful set of recommendations and meaningful changes were made that meant um, there were substantial changes to the way that offshore oil and gas operations were run and there have been no repeat accidents of that scale. The Dunblane inquiry um, led Parliament to pass much stronger um, gun control legislation. The Macpherson report into uh, the death of Stephen Lawrence um, installed the concept of institutional racism um, into public life. And it's precisely, we argue, because inquiries have the potential to make such important changes that we need to take the aftermath of inquiries more seriously. As it stands, far too many inquiries produce recommendations which go unheeded. The inquest into the 7-7 bombings in 2005 noted that recommendations for better radio communication between transport and emergency workers that was made as far back as 1987 in the inquiry into the King's Cross fire hadn't been implemented. A failure to reform death certification procedures for doctors after the Shipman inquiry saw the same recommendation made again years later in the Midstaff's inquiry. So to ensure that inquiries all have impact and that sensible recommendations are implemented, we make a number of recommendations for change. First of all, government has to be clear and comprehensive in setting out its own response to inquiries. That means going far beyond a statement from the Prime Minister or the Secretary of State and instead making it the norm for governments to produce a full and detailed account of how it's going to either implement recommendations or if it's not going to, explaining why not. Second, there's got to be a much better system of parliamentary scrutiny um, that begins the day an inquiry ends and continues for at least five years afterwards. Scrutinising public inquiry should in fact become a core part of the work of select committees. But since 1990, only six inquiries have received a full and comprehensive oversight process by our parliamentary select committees. That cannot be right. Third, we think there are opportunities for inquiries to produce findings more quickly in some cases to promote change. Since 1990, again, nine inquiries have taken more than five years to produce their final reports. And on average, they take about two and a half years from, uh, from start to final report. And in the space between an inquiry beginning and the final report coming out, there's the danger of similar incidents taking place. And there's also the danger that institutions have moved on so much in those two and a half years, five years, seven years, however long it is, that the recommendations are essentially rendered redundant. So borrowing from the air accident investigation branch, we're suggesting that interim inquiry reports should be published as rapidly as possible um, after an incident, setting out any immediate necessary changes. And fourth, we need to make sure that policy development expertise is really brought to bear during the inquiry process. Developing really detailed, implementable recommendations requires obviously a range of different skill sets that it's not realistic to expect a single chair to possess. So to ensure that recommendations are constructed well and effectively and with the greatest chance of implementation, inquiry should involve expert witnesses, including those who have experience of policy development when constructing recommendations. So those are four kind of recommendations for how we can improve the impact of inquiries and make sure that they are listened to and lead to change. But if I had to highlight only one, it's the need for better scrutiny. Inquiries are convened in the most serious cases and their recommendations deserve similarly serious treatment by government. And to ensure that's done, Parliament should take on the role of protecting the public trust, ensuring that the millions that we spend on public inquiries is not wasted and holding the government publicly accountable for delivering change. Thank you. Emma, thanks very much indeed. Um, thanks for taking us right across those and those, those four recommendations. Um, Jason, what do you make of this? If I ask you the simple question, how effective are inquiries? I, I'd start from a slightly different perspective. I would um, say one needs to look at the reasons for establishing an inquiry and the functions that they perform um, before asking the question, how effective are they? And I would divide inquiries, as Emma has done, into three, um, sometimes overlapping. Firstly, there are inquiries that establish the what happened. And they're pretty simple. Um, an inquiry like the Al Sweaty inquiry. Did um, the British Army murder um, 20 or so Iraqi civilians in a detention camp in Iraq in 2004? So that's a what happened inquiry where no recommendations really need to be made. 
Then the second type of inquiry is, uh, um, we know roughly what happened, but why did it happen and who's to blame? So an accountability type inquiry. And that may be um, successful by finding out who was responsible, attributing blame. And then the, the third type of inquiry might be more focused upon recommendations. And it might be more of a broad inquiry into um, social policy or other issues. And so the measure of success of an inquiry um, cannot be looked at just through the prism of how many good recommendations it made which were then implemented. So I think we need to sort of sweep that out of the way first to say that the measure of success is not merely re recommendations. In terms of uh, how to measure success uh, in terms of recommendations and um, what can be done to improve, which the IFT has rightly said it needs to be improved, the success rate of inquiries, recommendations. There's a dual responsibility. One must be things that are within the control of the inquiry. And then there are things that are outside the control of the inquiry. In terms of outside the control of the inquiry, I think it starts from the person appointed to conduct the inquiry. Um, judicial chairs, this is an old chestnut, um, are obviously very good at inquiry types one and two at finding out what happened and who's to blame. They are perhaps less good at formulating recommendations on social policy issues. And yet, th when there's a call for an inquiry, one reaches for a judicial chair um, as the first port of call. It's seen as the gold standard for reasons of independence, um, in, <coughs> in particular, and authority. So I think it starts right from the beginning. How do you best implement recommendations? Starts right from the beginning. Um, who, who is best conducting the inquiry? When the thing's up and running, the inquiry's obviously got responsibility for it. It's quite an interesting piece of academic research in, I think it's the only piece of academic research um, before this report. Um, in Canada in 2008, a, a meta-analysis looking at what um, leads to successful implementation of inquiry recommendations. And they, they found three things. Firstly, a short <coughs> inquiry is more likely to lead to its recommendations being implemented than a long one, for the reasons that Emma's given, but also for change of government reasons. Um, if it lasts longer, there's been a change of administration. Uh, people are less likely to implement recommendations that relate to their predecessors. Secondly, bringing on board um, policy makers and those that are likely to have to implement the recommendations at the stage of formulation, including costing the recommendations. You're much more likely to have implementation if the recommendations have been costed and there's been feasibility work done at the point of the formulation of the recommendations. And thirdly, involving a broad church, uh, bringing in um, not just those that have been there for finding out what um, happened and what went wrong and who was to blame, which is a very narrow focus, but bringing in um, charities, um, uh, uh, campaigning groups, uh, think tanks, people whose daily work involves the subject matter of the inquiry at the point of making recommendations. So opening the thing out much more than has been uh, the case to date. So I, I absolutely agree with the recommendations made, but add those additional points. It's really helpful. Thanks very much indeed. Joshua, I mean, what do you make of this argument that, I mean, it would be entirely plausible that there are many different, or several different kinds uh, of inquiry, uh, and so several different standards of success, if you like, um, and what does that do to public expectations about, about success? Do people uh, get these mixed up? Uh, yes, they do, and, and different people want different things from an inquiry, and um, it's an excellent report, and, and I agree with its broad recommendations. But are we perhaps making an assumption that the recommendations of an inquiry should be put into effect by government. I think that's perhaps underlying what we're saying. We've avoided that in, the, in this report, but it's a, it's a very, very good point. Well, uh, yes, because, um, you know, the, certainly there should be scrutiny of whether the recommendations mm. have been put into effect. 
But, you know, this is the Institute for Government. It's for government to govern. The government of the day must decide what to do. If it gets it wrong, we hold it to account through all the ways that we know very well. But just because an inquiry mm. says this is what should be done, it doesn't follow that that is the right policy to approach. Certainly, it's incumbent on the government of the day to explain why it is re rejecting or at least not implementing particular recommendations, especially if they involve money. Um, but if they have some good reason for saying uh, that the recommendations are wrong because they have been, to take Jason's point, made by a judge who is unfamiliar with social policy and this recommendation is to deal with social policy, or because, take the Leveson inquiry, um, the approach towards the press has changed and the government doesn't want to take on the media, or whatever it may be, certainly the government needs to explain, but we shouldn't assume that just because an inquiry has recommended something, it should be done. Mm. No, a, a really good point. Uh, Emma, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, I completely agree with that, but I suppose I would say that there are legitimate reasons for government to not implement recommendations and illegitimate reasons for government to not implement recommendations. And um, the Shipman Inquiry is a good example where there were um, uh, a wide ranging set of recommendations. Government chose to implement some but not others. And some of the reasoning it gave for not implementing some of the recommendations around, for instance, um, prescribing the use of, of opiates was because they thought they went too far and that it would involve people <coughs> being in more pain than they needed to be. So it was able to give a kind of strong justification, um, an evidence-based justification for why it chose not to implement some of those recommendations. And I think that's really what we're looking for. What we're looking for is not for government to implement every recommendation that an inquiry makes, but we are looking for it to engage with each of those recommendations and provide a proper explanation for those that it chooses not to implement. I think what is less legitimate is when government ignores recommendations with no explanation as to why, and that is something we have seen happen. And um, I think that is something we should be more concerned about um, when government chooses to begin an inquiry, to invest millions of pounds into it, and not least to build public expectations that something might change on the basis of that inquiry. I think the least we can expect is an explanation as to why they choose not to move forward with recommendations. So what do we do if we don't get one? An, an interesting contrast, um, I suppose, is the way that coroners make um, uh, prevention of future death reports, PFD so-called, um, after the conclusion of some inquest to prevent a recurrence um, of circumstances that may lead to a, a similar fatality. And there there's enshrined in legislation a requirement on uh, persons, usually organisations or public authorities, to whom a PFD report is addressed to address it within 56 days mm. or provide a reason why they can't. Now, um, addressing, answering the PFD report does not mean um, accepting mm. the conclusions. It's um, providing a response to it within 56 days to say why, whether they accept um, the, the PFD recommendations in inverted commas, and if not, um, why not? At the moment, there isn't any equivalent statutory or parliamentary obligation mm on government to respond to the outfall of an inquiry. There's a convention that there's a, um, a ministerial statement, um, either oral or written, but that um, he, he usually adopts a relatively formulaic approach of um, thanks um, and we'll get on with it. it, it it's mm. not granular. Um, and then after that, there are some very good examples of inquiries which have um, themselves uh, continued to graft the nettle. Bichard is a, mm. a brilliant yeah. one, where uh, um, his um, uh, background in the civil service meant that he wasn't going to wash his hands a bit, that, 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 that a, a judge might think that that's the right thing to do. You know, I'm functus now, I tie up the red tape and I pass it back, I've done my job. Whereas Bichard thought, no, um, I've got to continue to um, have ownership of this. I've got to um, convene every six months and I've got to test um, and stress test my, the response to my recommendations, which is anathema to many judges. Including, including Sir Brian Leveson, absolutely explicitly. He was absolutely clear that, as you say, once he had finished his inquiry, it was a matter for government and he has refused to answer questions on it ever since, although I don't think I'm giving away any secrets when I say he's very interested in how the response 
uh, has gone to well, what he's recommended. He would see it as undermining of his role uh, he as, would. as a judge and undermining yes. of yes. the role of the judiciary to yes. comment I mean, on... Yeah, uh, because he, he's gone back to the day job unlike some of the judges, retired judges, who've done this. And, and he, he felt that he could only go back to the day job if he finished and, went and, and, and didn't get involved in it anymore. And do, you, do you think there should be an obligation on government to give, an, um, to give a response to it? Yes, yes, I do. I think, I think um, there should be a response to, uh, on, on presumably, the minister who sets up the inquiry or that minister's successor uh, to respond within a certain period and to say which of the recommendations are being put into effect, like a response mm. to a select committee report. Mm. Mm. So yes, why not? As, as Emma argues in the report, um, the select committee, um, which ironically enough used to be the vehicle for hmm. actually conducting these inquiries into national tragedies and disasters, but which fell out of favour in the 20s because of um, committees div dividing along political lines and paralysis um, ought to be the ideal vehicle if it can't actually conduct the investigation itself it ought to be the vehicle to pick up the ball and run with it after the conclusion of the inquiry it could at least do that the select committee system um, it, it is ideally placed to um, uh, monitor um, the extent to which recommendations are accepted are being implemented <coughs> or whether there are good reasons for the rejection of recommendations. And for that you can turn to our work on select committees, which there, um, uh, there, there is a lot. Let me just ask you finally before we go to questions, and I think there'll be quite a few. I mean, do you think we're using public inquiries too much as opposed to back royal commissions or inquests or indeed select committees? The, 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 this is very interesting. I mean, royal commissions have gone out of favour. Uh, they take too long. They're, they're expensive. I mean, your report says they are best for a general issue of policy rather than response to a specific uh, uh, tragedy. Uh, and, and that must be right. Um, um, inquests, it was very curious. I know you can't comment on Grenfell. But it was very curious that after the Grenfell disaster, there was a campaign. I even saw somebody chalked on a wall in Portland Place near the BBC, inquest now, as if an inquest was a better way of dealing with the tragedy than an inquiry. Now you give examples of inquests that have been turned into public inquiries with some difficulty in order to give more scope to the person who was acting coroner, Litvinenko case is the best example, there are others, uh, who then becomes the inquiry chair. Um, uh, an inquest um, has tremendous limitations, um, all sorts of restrictions, um, uh, and um, gives the coroner absolute power. Inquests haven't been reformed for 800 years. Uh, I mean, it's an extraordinary jurisdiction. Um, and, and the idea that an inquest would be better than a public inquiry, except in a very, very limited area, uh, strikes me as very strange. But obviously, the concept of a public inquiry with the government appointing the chair has been discredited in some people's minds. Um, perhaps there's more to it than meets the eye, to the extent that they have been calling for an inquest on the basis that a coroner is in independent, um, uh, whereas an inquiry chair is supposed to be partial. I, I don't buy that at all. I, I wouldn't say we've used them too much. I, I can't think of a, an inquiry which could have been better conducted using a different vehicle, i.e. an mm, inquest. Mm, mm. Um, a select committee or a review, a desktop review or a panel. I, I, there have been a lot of them um, and there has been a, the suspicion that government reaches for them too quickly in order to kick an issue into the long grass or whatever. But I can't think of a better vehicle in any of the recent inquiries that over the last um, 10 or 15 years or so um, to conduct the searching examination that has been necessary. Thank you. On that, let's go to questions. Who would like to start us off? Over, over by the door. I'm the Secretary of the Grenfell Inquiry, as some of you know. Um, the puzzle, I suppose, I, just to say, I, I think the best model is um, Piper Alpha, where Lord Cullen 
basically after lots of thinking and work really rather rapidly, came out with really powerful recommendations that both government and the industry just got on and did uh, after some time. And that's certainly what's in my head is what good looks like for something like something like what we're trying to grapple with. The, the, and I, I, having read your report, I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was really on the money and really opposite to something we're trying to sort of grapple with in real time. The puzzle, and I'd be grateful for advice really, including from people after this event, is how do you enable a judicial process, a courtroom, not exactly a courtroom process, but a judicial-led process to lead to sensible public policy? That is... Because we, we have to. I mean, the test has to be we do something that government just says, an industry just says yes to. If we do something that people can't find they can implement, then I think we have missed a trick. We, are, we have failed. The inquiry would have failed if, if it cannot be implemented in some way. Why, we, why have we put all the families through all that uh, trauma? Why have we gone to all that effort if you can't get on and do it? So the bar is quite high. The puzzle is how do you, through what do you do in addition to how do you run an in a courtroom-like process that leads to public policy, leads to sensible, implementable public policy. That's the, that's the thing we're grappling with. That's the thing I'd be really grateful for help with and advice on. Thank, thank you for that. Um, can, I, can I start with a problem? And it's a systemic problem, which I don't think you necessarily grapple with in your report about the Grenfell Inquiry. It's, it's not a new problem. It is one I identified six months ago. Um, but it's not one to which I have got much of an answer. And that is the problem of a criminal prosecution. Because it strikes me that you, as the Grimfell Inquiry, can't get very far while there are criminal proceedings in prospect. I don't know how far you can go. I don't know what you can do. I do know that anybody advised uh, by counsel to, uh, who, who is in the frame for prosecution is going to be advised not to say anything to you, the inquiry, while they are in the frame for prosecution for fear that it will incriminate them. And I don't know how you grapple with that. Um, the only way to avoid that is to take the unpalatable step of saying that people won't face criminal prosecutions arising from Grenfell. It's probably not a good idea for me to speculate on how likely it is that anybody's going to be convicted of corporate manslaughter arising from that fire. But I think I can say that it's difficult to say that any one individual is responsible for a tragedy to which a lot of different individuals, actors, organisations may have contributed in various ways that you're going to deal with. So the question of policy is whether you say at the outset nobody will be prosecuted in which case you can proceed to find out what happened quite quickly. Um, you can then make recommendations quite quickly, uh, which can then be dealt with by government. Um, as it is, I imagine it will take much longer than people hope and maybe even expect because it will take a long time for the question of criminal liability to be considered by the CPS, despite the rather curious response of the police, which is to announce at the outset that people are going to face charges, as if it was up to them to decide. Um, I agree that politically the decision to announce no prosecution, which would have to come from the Prime Minister, is one that no Prime Minister would want to take. But I do think it's the only way to clear the inquiry to find out, above all, why the tragedy happened, and then to come up with recommendations. Now, you can see I've avoided your specific question, which is how the inquiry can make recommendations that are uh, implementable by government. I'm not sure that's the responsibility of the inquiry. I think the inquiry, if it finds out exactly when, what went wrong, where the responsibility lay, um, how that responsibility could have been exercised differently, who made mistakes and, and, and what those mistakes were, it shouldn't be very difficult for government to put into effect reforms that strengthen oversight in a particular area, that uh, increase responsibility, uh, that may be divided between different actors, or whatever it may be. I, think you're, I don't think you should worry too much about 
how government implements your recommendations, I think you should worry more about what the recommendations were, and that depends on what caused the tragedy. I just, I just sorry, we want to pause on, on, on this a second because, I mean, your point about the criminal investigation in parallel is, is one, you know, surely it's one about timing. Uh, many inquiries, as we've been discussing, do make recommendations for policy. Would you like to come back on that well, answer? On the, on the criminal investigation in parallel, we are grappling with that in real time. Yeah. We have to grapple with it in real time. We are assigned mm -hmm. an MOU for the police to try and organise that. Much cleverer lawyers than I are grappling with how that works in practice, but we'll have to, we'll to see. Um, but, you know, we but, but yeah. Right. And on the, on the public policy thing, I just, I personally have this view that we will have, we have to do something that government can implement and the industry, the relevant industry can get on and do. If we don't spend another sort of period of time working out and things will just get lost and we're lost on the point of what we're doing, we'll see. Yeah. Um, well. um, I think I'd slightly disagree with um, Joshua's argument that it's not the responsibility of the inquiry to create implementable recommendations. I think it is the responsibility of the inquiry to do that. And I think one of the ways it could look at doing that is actually by thinking about the process slightly differently to the way that you outline, Mark. So I think you're absolutely right that you need to begin with um, a judicial-like process, as, as you said, to establish the kind of what happened questions. But I'm not sure you need to run the entire inquiry like a courtroom. And I think you can look to some historical precedent for how to do this well. Um, the inquiry into the Bristol Royal Infirmary um, that looked at uh, failures around cardiac surgery in children took a really interesting approach. They started with the courtroom model where they established what had happened. It was um, looking back over um, a, a relatively long period from the kind of mid-80s to, to mid-90s. Um, but they then did a phase two. After they'd established what happened, they had a distinct process that was about policy recommendation development and it was not a courtroom style process it was a seminar style process that brought together the kind of broad audience that you described Jason um, that included policy experts um, healthcare specialists NGOs and charities and really worked to create a powerful set of recommendations by bringing those groups together and they used a seminar process because they thought that that more kind of open slightly less kind of formal way of doing things would allow them to uh, develop stronger recommendations and, and by all accounts those we've spoken to felt that <coughs> the inquiry was able to do that so I'd say it, it is the responsibility of the inquiry and I don't think it needs to be run solely like a, a courtroom process. Right, I'm not going to speak about Grenfell mm -hmm. because I'm representing government in the inquiry. Um, it, it's um, part of government in the inquiry. It's no surprise that Piper Alpha is seen as the model because I, I think the reason for that is that it was in an industry that responded in the same way as the air industry responds to accidents. It had a precautionary safety first um, approach and that's not necessarily the same where um, it, it must be government that acts rather than industry. Um, uh, and so it, it's quite difficult to lift out of things like Piper Alpha or other air accident um, investigations an approach that easily fits things that are more social policy issues. As for more generally, how does one ensure that uh, public inquiries, recommendations on social policy issues um, are implemented, then that's the subject matter of the report. Mm -hmm. it, um, it, it's partly the inquiry's responsibility, which is what Emma's just said, as to how the inquiry conducts itself. I've mentioned a couple of things about bringing people in, mm -hmm. costing, actually costing things. <coughs> it's very easy after um, an inquiry mm -hmm. has finished for government to say, yes, but it's been made by a head in the clouds lawyer who's got no idea um, of how much things cost, how difficult it is. Bring them in beforehand, um, mm. uh, have some ownership and some input into the process, um, is what I would say. Okay, we've got, thank you. I'm glad we spent a bit of time on that. We've got a lot of uh, hands up. Um, let's go here and here. Uh, let's, take, let's take two. Simon Webb, it was, <coughs> it was my privilege actually to be responsible for the welfare of the transport investigation branches for a period. They were independent statutorily, but I looked after them. And a grim job they have if you think about uh, cameras in trains that have crashed. Um, uh, one of their great benefits, though, is that they can take evidence in confidence 
for the prevention of future accidents. And that evidence is not available to the prosecuting authorities unless directed by a High Court judge. And that seems to me that separation of, of in investigation, and they, of course, are technical people, so they can make recommendations as to policy, is, is a crucial element of this. And don't think anybody let, this lets anybody off, because I can remember a case where there was a, a yacht was run over by, by a, a, um, a cruise liner in, in Southampton Water. And uh, they gave evidence, the crew gave evidence about what had gone wrong. Actually, it was the pe people were wearing the wrong glasses at night and the radar was wrong. And that was implemented. And the police interviewed separately and, and, mounted, and the Crown Prosecution brought a prosecution, which failed. But the, but the, the disciplinary people from the shipping industry had their own inquiry and took action and, and people were suspended from their jobs. So I think you can separate these two things out and, and I think it's very interesting and there's a protocol which lies around between the police and the accident investigating authorities which automatically applies so you don't have this sort of squab, you know, that, that sort of elegant debate between people when the accidents actually occur. The other thing I was just going to say, I, I do think the point about not overreacting is, is, is also very important and one other thing, a good inquiry I think can produce having been a bit of a policy maker myself, is to produce the evidence on which you can do a regulatory impact assessment. You can weigh the costs against the benefits. And just to give an example, and on railways, we know we spend five times as much preventing railway accidents now as we do road accidents, only because some inquiries had, 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 had promoted, <coughs> you know, probably excessive responses. But the lifts is the greatest example in Europe where, where the EU regulated after a couple of lift accidents for every lift in Europe to be expected every two years, which is promoted by the lift industry. And, and, and it still adds the cost of every building you can pretty well go in in Europe. And actually, it was a complete overreaction. And if you'd done the work properly on the policy, it would have told you to inspect every 10 years, not every, every two. And a lot of money would be saved. So I think this separation of, uh, out of, of mm. evidencing and Real impact assessment is of an important dimension. Very, very, of very important point. So, thanks. That's very, very helpful. Straight behind you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name uh, is Melanie Phelan. I am from the community in North Kensington and have been uh, one of those uh, community responders that you've all heard about uh, since the fire and uh, continue. Uh, to uh, be in that role, not through choice, but through need. Um, I have, uh, I've sat through the, uh, the start of the public inquiry, or through, through the procedures of the public inquiry, the two days uh, uh, on Monday and Tuesday this week. Um, I just have a, a couple of points, if that's okay. I, if you can keep them brief, because I, I, well, I'm, I'm all for a debate. Um, yeah. Uh, with our panelists. And these, are, these are interesting points, but there's an awful lot of people there. And I presume actual questions. So, really, really quick okay. points, please. Uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, point out from, um, from a community point of view uh, about a public inquiry being the only way to openly find out uh, why uh, the incident, or in this case, uh, what we believe is an atrocity, uh, happened. Um, and I believe since 2005, the terms of reference are determined entirely uh, by the government, uh, which is an issue for us. We, we have asked again and again for, uh, for example, for social housing, uh, for, for different aspects to be brought into the inquiry. Um, and uh, uh, on, on many occasions, it's been, uh, it's been refused, unfortunately. Um, so I'm almost there. Uh, 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 in, in response to can recommendations or are they uh, followed, um, Elizabeth Campbell, who is, the, uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, the head of uh, our RBKC, which is our council, uh, today in the Evening Standard says uh, she has refused to commit to putting sprinklers into all tower blocks in the borough in the wake of the Grenfell fire. Almost six months after the disaster that killed 71 people, Councillor Elizabeth Campbell only said she would consider the option. London Fire Commissioner Dan uh, Fire Mel Commissioner Melanie, we, we can yes, forgive okay. me or get the sound. But, but it is, yeah. it, yes, okay, okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, she was staggered, I was about to yep. say. I'm finished now with that point. Uh, but obviously, if it isn't, uh, if the recommendations aren't followed through, this is what you get because people don't understand that it needs to be done. Um, okay. okay. So, Melanie, and, and if Melanie no one you, is you, forgive me, and just in fair, I, they're, they're really good points, and I want to pick up that one about terms of reference because an awful lot of people with their hands up. Okay. And I want to give them a fair chance, but thank you very much sure. for this. Straight next to you, please. Oh. 
Uh, straight next to you. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, Tony Thompson. Um, I just wanted to point out the, 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 the relationship between the police. I've been involved in inquiries dating back from King's Cross through Clapham and others. And we set up uh, a number, quite a, a sensible relationship where we were releasing the police were servicing the inquiry or in various inquiries by producing evidence. Um, it's not a, it was, it was a challenging thing to set up, but we provided evidence to the public inquiry, a number of different public inquiries into the rail instance. It worked very well. I know there's a Metropolitan Police, uh, the memorandum of understanding with Grenville, but the, the, which, but the, it, we did it and it worked uh, on a number of different occasions so I don't see it being a, a handicap. The only handicap might be the reluctance of the police to release uh, the, the documentation in this occasion but it's been done in the past so the precedent's there and it worked. Thank you. Very useful point, thanks. Can we go right to the back? Yeah, um, <coughs> my name is Peter Riddle, I'm a former director of the Institute for Government but in this context I was a member of the Privy Council inquiry into detainees and rendition. Um, a rather abortive inquiry because it was never formally launched. Uh, it was set up in 2010 and then effectively abandoned 18 months later. And it comes exactly to the point that Joshua raised and has been raised about the police. Because it is, obviously there, there are, depending on the nature of what has happened and the understandings between police and investigating authorities and the law on some transport things is very different. But certainly in our case, because there were police inquiries into two allegations against um, um, SIS and the security service, um, we could not gather new evidence. Um, we could look at existing evidence. The argument was, if, if we asked for evidence, that would then become relevant to police inquiry. And we had to wait. And so there was an elaborate dance as we waited for the, um, and it underlines Joshua's point about the CPS being independent. Um, we did not know where the police or CPS inquiry, every month we, we kind of wondered, would something be happening? And eventually it did. Then fresh allegations came out about Lib Libya. So the police thing is a matter of time, but the real point is uncertainty on time. And, and in this case, it proved, made the case abortive and moved on. The second point I want to make is, is, is touching on the and it, it, I think it's relevant to Grenfell, the different motives of people setting up inquiries. Government looks for policy responses. It's quite clear in the case of detainees, what they wanted was what were new guidelines for the agencies and foreign office and home office to deal with detainees and rendition. For the detainees and their lawyers, it was truth and reconciliation. And there is a conflict between the two, and it, 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 was, it was an unresolved conflict between the two, and that's clearly an element of what's happening on Grenfell. So I think what's got to bear in mind is not just different types of inquiry, it's different things happening in the same inquiry. Just one final up-to-date thing. Today, it's an interesting point in relation to what Emma said in her excellent report, is that the Committee on Standards and Public Life have produced a report today on intimidation of people involved in politics. That is a standing committee. And one of the members said, we'll come back in a year's time and look and see what the government's done on this. But that is an exception, not even the judges who don't follow it up, but also, I mean, that underlines your point as a locus and the importance of a parliamentary committee's doing so. All right, thank you. I want to come back to the panel at this point. I'm going to try and get as, absolutely as many in as I can. But we've got a, a couple of points there. One about the police and actually views on both sides about whether it's a problem or not. Uh, and then this other one, which Peter and, and Melanie raised in in different ways about whether different things are going on inside an inquiry that actually pull in, in different directions. Go ahead. Well, um, it's a recurrent theme, a concurrent um, police investigation into um, an incident in which death or serious injury has been caused and a public inquiry into the same subject matter. And the options are, one, you sequence them, do the police first, then the inquiry second. Which can be very slow. Which can be slow. Um, two, um, what <coughs> Joshua um, su suggested, namely an undertaking by the DPP or the attorney that evidence given by somebody to the inquiry will not be used against them in any future proceedings. And um, that's been done in the past mm -hmm. as a means by which to try and get the truth <coughs> out of people. The Bahamusa inquiry, the Al Sweaty inquiry are examples of that, where um, soldiers um, uh, were encouraged to tell the truth by um, those kind of undertakings. Or three, what Brian Leveson did is do the two at the same time. And he had what he called his self denying ordinance, where he wouldn't inquire into things that he thought 
that might cause prejudice to a, um, a, a criminal trial or require people to give evidence to him in a way that uh, might prejudice their rights. Um, and he put that off to what was going to be phase two of his inquiry, but which um, mm. but he, he hasn't come back to. So um, there are a range of ways in which it can be done, but it is um, at the heart of it an intractable problem. I think that's right. And, and, and I think Peter's point about the motives of uh, setting up an inquiry is absolutely fundamental. Um, the cynical journalist would say, uh, and, and this is reflected in your report, that inquiries are set up to get the government off the hook, um, to give the minister something to say to parliament, to give the minister breathing space. Um, and if the minister is fortunate, then the minister won't be there by the time the inquiry reports. Um, and if the minister is very fortunate, the problem will have gone away. Uh, Bloody Sunday, for example. Um, if, if you can forgive me a personal reflection, I did ask Mark Saville after he concluded the inquiry um, when he might report, and he said, well, it won't be before next summer, and it was actually five years after next summer that he actually reported, and he, he completely uh, failed to uh, estimate the correct length of time this would take. But the, 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 uh, Melanie's point about who uh, decides the terms of reference, well, yes, the government does decide. The government decides the terms of reference very much in, con in conjunction with the person who's chairing the inquiry and, uh, these days, and, and, and it's all agreed. But on the other hand, um, and, 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 and we, we know to take Grenfell again that Martin Morbick did not want to look at the social issues um, that obviously campaigners like you are so concerned about. Um, and um, uh, he's arguably not best suited to do that um, and he has a very fair point when he says this would increase the length of time that the inquiry would take um, and um, it, uh, my wish, and I have nothing to do with this, as I've said already, is to find out what happened and try and prevent it happening again. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't re uh, just to deal with your point about sprinklers, um, I don't know whether sprinklers are the right thing in residential tower blocks or not. Uh, that's for the inquiry to tell me or for the government to decide. Uh, but I certainly don't expect the government to announce it's going to put in sprinklers uh, before uh, the, the inquiry has, has reported. But the motives of setting them up are absolutely crucial and the government's problem is that it deliberately fudges the issue of successive governments by coming up with several different motives and hoping that something will come out in the wash. Thank you. Emma. I also just wanted to talk to Melanie's point on the terms of reference. Um, obviously, in the case of Grenfell, there's been real challenges over establishing um, a set of references that uh, are acceptable both to the chair, to the government, and indeed to the families and victims um, in the community who have wanted to see social housing captured as part of those terms of reference, and right now it's not included. And I think this challenge speaks to kind of broader issues for the Grenfell inquiry and for other similar inquiries into building trust with the community, with families and victims. And if we're saying that one of the measures of success for an inquiry is the extent to which its recommendations are taken forward, clearly another is the extent to which it actually gains the trust and support of the community and the victims in question. Um, and I think this is going to be a real challenge for the Grenfell inquiry and I'm not sure whether Mark's still in the room but I think one of the things the inquiry needs to think through is um, what kind of processes can it use um, during the inquiry to make sure that victims, um, families and the community do feel they have an adequate voice and one of the suggestions made so far has been that the inquiry looks to actually the process used in the Hillsborough inquests um, that ran from 2014 where the, bere the bereaved were invited to, to talk um, as part of the process about somebody they'd, they'd lost and I'd be very interested in the other panellists' views on whether that would be possible. Um, but clearly the inquiry does have to um, consider the victims right at, right at the heart of the process. Great, thanks. Okay, let's go over to this side. Um, here, nearest the door and then I'm going to come behind you and, and, and down to the front. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Ken Sutton. I was responsible for establishing the Hillsborough Independent Panel for its conduct and for coordinating the work on the Hillsborough after that. Um, just on Joshua's point, in that case, uh, clearly, the inquiry, if that's what we want to call the Independent Panel, did lead subsequently to new inquests and to um, criminal investigations and prosecutions which wouldn't have happened uh, but for that inquiry. Um, 
more relevant, I think, to uh, the discussion tonight is that with the greater freedom that we had by being outside of the 2005 Act um, framework, I was certainly able to um, discuss the terms of reference with the Hillsborough families in advance, so that when the government published the terms of reference, they were able to do so in the, with the confidence that uh, those terms of reference um, were supported by the uh, relevant families. So I think there's something about the process by which the inquiry starts, which can be more engaged with the uh, relevant uh, families. My other point, just to um, ask really, is uh, whether the speakers have anything to say about what was really critical in that case, which was having a panel, not a single chair. And we had uh, Bishop James Jones's chair, mm. who was able directly to engage with the Hillsborough families in a way that nobody else has, but also eight other panel members with specific competencies. And what that ensured was that the panel's report was able to draw together expertise, uh, which a single person, be it a judge or anybody else, uh, wouldn't have been able to do. Thank, thank you, good points. All right, we're running you know, steadily out of time. I'm gonna try and take in quite a few more. Can we, uh, kindly restricted to, if you forgive me, one question. All right. Um, um, I'm Jade Kenny, and I'm a lawyer at the Department of Health. And my question is, it kind of sort of links in with this. Are inquiries under the Inquiries Act um, superior to non-statutory ones? And if so, why? That's a good point. Let's come over here to the back, back middle. Um, Thank you. Um, Thank you, Alex Allen. Um, I was going to ask a very similar point about the a single chair as running a panel as opposed to having a full panel. Um, I mean, I note that, you know, for example, in Grenfell, we're hearing demands that there should be a panel, but the House of Lords uh, Select Committee in 2014 recommended that an inquiry panel should consist of a single member, unless there are strong reasons to the contrary. Okay. So I'd be interested. Thank, thank, thank you very much indeed. And over here. I'm Paul Twyman. In my youth, I was on the secretariat of the Roscoe Commission on the third London airport, which does date me, rather. Um, can I ask the panel, because I do have a question, what their views are on how we square the circle in having all the benefits of a judge uh, with giving some advocacy for the recommendations? Because uh, Eustace Roskill, went back on the bench and said nothing. There was a minority report from Professor Buchanan. He went round talking about his minority report and we were stuffed from day one, frankly. Um, okay, great, great, you forget, forgive me. Let's take, take quick answers to these and then I'm gonna get him one last batch uh, at the front. Okay, we've got engagement with families. We've got uh, a couple on panel um, versus a single uh, chair. We've got um, uh, the Inquiries Act and the, uh, the advantage have been set up under that, and we've got um, uh, this last one. Should, anyway, go ahead. Um, yeah. uh, very quickly, on the panel, the, 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 the advantage of the panel um, is that it, it's not a public inquiry in the sense of um, people coming and, and, and making representations in a courtroom session. It gets on with its work behind closed doors. It reports, obviously, and uh, produces documents, puts them online, and uh, reaches results. As to how well that works, um, I can't say, you can, I can't, because I haven't seen it working, you have. Uh, the whole point of it is it works behind closed doors, not necessarily a bad thing, um, but, but I, can see, uh, and I can see that it, it was effective in what it did. To take, take the point that followed you about the statutory inquiry, your panel doesn't have statutory powers to demand documents in principle unless government gives it that power you would have thought inquiry act powers are very important i thought when the inquiry act was passed it gave much too much power to the minister to block an inquiry to sack the chair and so on fortunately that hasn't been a problem i think a single chair is better because if it's the right person, he or she can handle the thing without having to carry uh, another panel. Of course, you know, if you, 
uh, look at the child abuse inquiry, you get the wrong chair. I'm thinking of Lowell Goddard particularly. It all goes pear-shaped and it's very fortunate mm. if there's somebody else to deal with it. Um, as for, as for um, a, a judge, squaring the circle, a, a judge um, and um, uh, people to campaign, I think that's a problem. Uh, that is a problem with, to, to which there's no answer. My last point is that if um, Martin Morbick Gets a, continues to get a hard time, it'll be very difficult to get further judges or retired judges to do this sort of thing. Thanks. Do you want to pick out any, any points, in, Emma? Sure. Um, on the question of a, a panel versus a single judge, I mean, I certainly agree that a single judge is unlikely to have the skill set you need to develop a powerful set of recommendations. I don't necessarily think that, I think what a panel is one way to deal with that. Um, they're using an expert panel in the case of Grenfell, although whether or not that's up to scratch remains to be seen. But I think there are other options that you can pursue as well. Um, I've already talked about the seminar process that was used as part of the Bristol inquiry. I think that's another way to bring expertise into the process. But I certainly think you need um, a a broader set of expertise than just the judge. Just On the question of um, advocacy and how you square the circle of judges wanting to you know, create a concrete wall between the end of the inquiry and uh, what comes next, I mean, I would say there are a couple of different ways into this. It's not always judges who chair inquiries, and when they don't chair inquiries, um, you tend to see others do act as advocates um, effectively. Bichard is a good example. After the SERM inquiry, he informally reconvened uh, the SERM inquiry uh, six months later to see what had happened. Actually, Robert Francis, um, a QC who ran the Midstaffs inquiry, has been a very powerful advocate for the uh, findings of the Midstaffs inquiry subsequently, and has worked with um, the Health Select Committee to try and uh, see those recommendations implemented. But I think this comes back to the recommendation we make in the report. You can't guarantee that you're going to have a chair who is going to act as an advocate, especially not when the majority of chairs are judicial. So therefore you need a proper procedure for making sure that government is held to account. And that surely has to be the role of Parliament. It's Parliament's role to make sure that ministers are held to account for the promises they make in the, in the aftermath of inquiries. And I think that's the way you square that circle. As, as for the question on whether mm -hmm. um, the inquiry is actually a superior um, species of inquiry. Um, it, it's tended to be the case that non-statutory inquiries, panels, desktop reviews, um, have been seen as an inferior vehicle. They've been the subject of huge criticism other than HIP because they don't um, have compulsory powers to obtain evidence, to require people to give evidence on oath. And they've been the subject of huge criticism for being a weak form of cover-up or whitewash. Um, that's been the criticism in the past. And so it's ironic that um, the, the, the opposite allegation has been laid at the door of inquiries formally convened under the Inquiries Act. Um, OK, thanks. I normally bring our events to a hard stop, but if the panel's OK for a few minutes more, let's, let's try and take in the very patient people here. Here, here, here on there, would you wait for the uh, microphone? Please? Um, Brunella Longo, I'm an information management consultant and author, and I was wondering if there is any experience of previous inquiries that have been uh, delayed in order to uh, wait for criminal investigation to uh, reach conclusion, or end <laughs> uh, previous inquiries in which terms of reference have included um, um, some um, um, direction, direction on uh, what sources to include, uh, to have to be included and considered by the, the chair or the leader, okay. but because that is possibly a way for government to uh, include more people, so be more um, inclusive, um, um, okay, so but, but, but also you know, more, more effective, more uh, productive. Very, very, very good question, thanks very much. I have to say, our report uh, deliberately did not home in on the beginning of the process, the terms of reference, uh, but on the end, yeah, in the front. Thank you. Uh, Sue Cameron, I'm a journalist. Um, you've talked about trying to cut down the time before uh, inquiries report, but what about cutting down the number of recommendations? Mm -hmm. There have been thousands mm -hmm. where nothing's been done, and some uh, inquiries in particular have made, I think the Francis report was one, 196 recommendations or something like that, with no attempt to prioritise them. You bet government doesn't implement them. Uh, should one of your recommendations perhaps be that inquiries should limit themselves to an 
a set number, a dozen or whatever, main recommendations, and if they've got other suggestions, then those should be prioritised. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, here on the aisle, and then straight behind, and then we're going to have to draw a close to it. My name's Steve Wright, and it's just about the three purposes of the inquiry, and obviously the third one, um, particularly around recommendations. So would it not be, rather than the judge with limited expertise telling um, public bodies what to do, he asked, asked the public bodies to come and tell him what they were going to do, thereby sidestepping any issues of legality, um, thereby avoiding the issues of costing and feasibility and doability. So you come and tell me what you're going to do and how you're going to do things differently in future. Um, it's akin to the duty of candor, but not. It's a flip of the candor, which I think is what we've done wrong, but just what we're going to do differently. Great. Thank you. And straight behind you. Um, Susie Symes. I'm a former Treasury economist, so I wanted particularly to welcome what Jason and others have said about, well, I don't want to use the term impact assessments, but um, doing cost-benefit analysis and looking at, at policy recommendations in a serious manner at the time that they're made, so there's, there are some comparisons. And to relate that in particular to the fourth recommendation of this very good report mm. about setting up a permanent, permanent inquiry, uh, public inquiries unit in the Cabinet Office as Parliament have so often recommended, a rep repository for expertise, for lessons, for all of these things, and perhaps also for separating inquiry chairs from being uh, serving civil servants. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to know what the panel think about why that hasn't happened. Great. Last point. Thank you. Let's go in this order. With last thoughts. Okay. Um, in reverse order, uh, certainly the Cabinet Office ought to do this. Why they don't, I can't say. Um, a, a cynical view is uh, money or they don't actually want to deal with these problems. I, I, I can't see. It's such an obvious recommendation. It's been made many times. Uh, the government really ought to capture some of the expertise and, and you make the point very clearly in your report. Um, asking public bod bodies what to do is a very interesting question. I'm not sure that public inquiries can constitutionally hold government departments to account in the way that, for example, select committees can do. I think that may be a matter for Parliament, but I'm not sure that an independent public inquiry can hold a minister to account. Um, and um, uh, as far as Sue's recommendation uh, that uh, an inquiry should prioritise a recommendation, it should certainly do that. Um, and in her spirit, um, I won't answer all the questions asked of me. I'll say I am there. Great. Thanks. Yes, I, I, I agree that the third limb of the Canadian report that I mentioned earlier was that um, his analysis found that inquiries with 10 or less recommendations um, had a higher hit rate in terms of successful imp implementation than with those with 11 or more. And it was pretty, it was very stark in Canada. It was a meta-analysis. It was only a sample size of about 35 or 40 going back 35 or 40 years, but it was a, it, it was a very good point. I um, wrote um, five years ago now in a book that the cabinet um, should set up a, um, a, a, a unit that um, is standing, um, uh, that comes back and sponsors inquiries time and again, rather than being a departmental responsibility. Because quite often, the department um, that's required to set up the inquiry is the department with the most interest in the subject matter um, as well, which can project uh, present interesting um, Chinese wall issues. Um, I, I'm not sure of the reason why, given that, as I also wrote, I, I've encountered the reinvention of square wheels um, in the 15 or so inquiries that I've done. Um, time and time again, the same issues come up um, and the same wrong solutions um, are um, mm. reached for in, in each one. Mm. I mean, it was just, I mean, so, you know, the subjects of inquiries are so different that obviously there might be a difference. I mean, unless one's recommendation is don't invade Iraq, then an inquiry on Iraq might that, that's have quite a bit to that, That's not the point. The, the, yeah, but but how I, you, I, I, look, I absolutely take the point. How you run yeah. it, how you appoint a secretary, how you put up calls for evidence, how you handle the public relations, which is something that Martin Morbick didn't get any advice on in the very, yeah. very, very early stages. We were talking about the number of, of recommendations. I yeah. think there might that's be a right. feeling yeah. that it... I think, I think, yeah, yeah. But, but not 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 necessarily from you. I'm talking about from you know independent yeah. uh, people. I, I, I think there might be a feeling that it's um, if you set up a standing unit, it might give the impression 
um, that it's just a sausage machine, mm. that it's one inquiry after the other, and that it's better to reach for a bespoke solution mm. to a specific problem. Mm. That, that might be their, their view. Mm. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that uh, inquiries come up with far too many recommendations or at the very least if they're going to come up with lots they should clearly prioritise. Um, I hope that by involving people with some policy development expertise in the process of coming up with recommendations that's one of the things they could help with. Um, on the point about establishing a permanent inquiries unit, just for those um, who aren't familiar with this debate, we recommend in the report as almost every report into public inquiries has done for the last 20 years that Cabinet Office sets up a permanent inquiries unit, it could be relatively small, that acts as a centre of expertise in government on public inquiries. Now the reasons for this are very sound. There are always public inquiries running. There have never been fewer than six public inquiries running at any one time for an extremely long time now. Only a few years ago there were 15 running simultaneously. So there is always a need for expertise around public inquiries in government. There is never a time that they are not running. Um, but despite that you see inquiries having to reinvent the wheel every time. You see some of our most senior judiciary, the senior civil service having to spend weeks just getting office space and telephone lines set up, that cannot be a good use of their time. Um, and perhaps most importantly of all, when the inquiry comes to an end, uh, there's nowhere for those people to um, capture what they have learnt about what works in an inquiry. Indeed, we saw the Secretary to the Grenfell Inquiry asking for advice about, uh, about you know, how to run an inquiry well, um, how to make sure that you come up with a powerful set of implementable recommendations. There is lots of advice there um, if we capture it well, and that's something that a Cabinet Office Inquiries Unit should do. Indeed, it's something that government already says should be done, it's just not done because there's nowhere for it to go at the moment. So it's, um, it's a sound recommendation. It's one that we've made, and it's one that's been made many, many times before, so I hope that uh, this time it's implemented. Four is a good number for recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. On, the, on that note, we'll go... We'll, no. I, I'm, I'm really sorry, we're going to have to stop. Um, I, uh, you're all very welcome to come join us next door and can keep talking to the panel, have a glass of, of wine as well. This is a vast subject. Any one of these inquiries could fill more than an hour of discussion, uh, not, not least uh, Grenfell, uh, and we're trying to cover uh, the general principles behind many. But thank you very much indeed for your points, your excellent questions, and can you join me in thanking the panel and Emma and Marcus. Thank you.